Habar Ghani. I salam alaikum. Oh, Hotep. You know Larry Ham gonna get it all right, right? How's everybody doing? My name is Ron Daniels. I'm president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. And we are so delighted to have all of you here for this town hall meeting. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be inspirational. You've just seen, many of you, the speech by Dr. Martin Luther King, which was delivered 50 years ago, 50 years ago on the date of his martyrdom, or before his martyrdom, actually. This is the speech that he delivered the night before he was taken away from us. And so we gather on a very, very auspicious occasion. We're going to have a great time this evening. And we want to be in a position to start it off um, right. And we want to begin that by having a welcome from the dynamic, energetic, and visionary person who is leading the charge to help make Newark a model city. And that's what we're here about. We're here because we believe in the vision of the Honorable Roz J. Baraka. Not only in terms of the lineage and the family and the person, but because of the policies. Danny Glover is always good about that. He, he talks about the, but it's about the policies. And so when the policies are personified in the person, we have a perfect synergy, if you will. And that's what we have. And so uh, we want to invite this uh, dynamic brother to come to the stage and to present uh, your welcome. Please welcome, if you will, uh, the, I have to say acting, I'm going to be lobbying, the acting Deputy Mayor, Director for Development and Economic and Housing Development, the one and only Carmelo Garcia. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dr. Daniels. It is an honor to be here with you. It's so exciting. I welcome you on behalf of the honorable and amazing Mayor Raj J. Baraka. That's right. As Dr. Daniel stated, I have the great joy and passion to lead the mayor's efforts to champion his vision and to make sure we implement a community wealth building model here in the city of Newark. And there's nothing greater than a national town hall meeting. Do you agree? One of the things that I love about Mayor Baraka, and I do have the distinction of working for a transformational leader, a man who is a humanitarian, a leader who is visionary and progressive, and is all about results for Newarkers first and always, whose heart and humanitarian efforts to get this city revitalized, reclaimed, and redeveloped is what we're doing for you. Every day, every day he holds us accountable. He is a champion for what any city in America should be pursuing, especially when you're celebrating 50 years of the vision and dream that Dr. King led, who was here in the city of Newark at that time leading the efforts for the Fair Housing Act. And we know more than ever today that you have a mayor, I have a boss, who first and foremost cares about his people and puts you first to make sure that equality in housing, health care, education, and jobs is paramount. Economic, employment, and environmental impact to grow this city. For equitable growth that makes a difference in all in each and every one of our lives. And so on behalf of Mayor Baraka, Council President Mildred Crump, and the City Council, our first African-American councilwoman, 
I get better applause than that. One of the beauties of this economic summit, as Dr. Daniels and Dr. Sanyik and I worked hard and my staff, you know, under the mayor's direction to make this happen with these distinct, amazing civic leaders who have poured out today and tomorrow policies and best practices to really put forth a urban Marshall Plan that will make a difference and set the tone, a national tone for what we're doing. Because we get it. We know what it takes and the mayor is leading that path, leading that light because as I always say, to whom much is given, much is required. So with that, we welcome you, we thank you because participation is democracy. Participation is democracy. And you being here tonight with us in the conversation, partaking with this amazing panel, distinct stars, the amazing Danny Glover, ambassador, humanitarian, one of a kind, representing here in the city of Newark. So enjoy, sit tight, be a part of the conversation, be empowered. It's an effective one. We thank you and God bless. Thank you, everyone. All right, a lot of energy up in here. That's what I like. And by the way, this is being streamed nationwide. We want the whole world to know what's happening in New Ark, as we used to say back in the day. All right, we want the whole world to know what's happening. And now to bring invocation, to bless this gathering. We have the pleasure of, in this order, bringing, and uh, she's my adopted pastor because she's the most energetic, dynamic, I mean, she got so much energy, I just, you know, if she just come by and I just get a whip, I'm, re I'm ready to roll. And y'all heard her on my radio show, so y'all, some of y'all heard her on my radio show a couple of weeks ago, I mean, she is really, really something else. And so we're going to hear from Reverend Louise Scott Roundtree, Clergy Affairs Manager of the City of New York, <laughs> followed by, followed by Imam Akil Mateen, Imam of Masjid Ashala. Shafichifa and President of United Muslims Incorporated of Newark, New Jersey. Let's give them a round of applause as they come. Good evening, everyone. Come on, we got to make some noise up in here. Newark is doing great things. We have a visionary that's doing great things, and it's a poor frog that don't praise his own bond. And I'm excited about the Honorable Mayor Raz Baraka. So can we really make some noise? Okay. Let, let's really make some noise. Newark is doing great things. I want to thank Ron Daniels for the opportunity to stand before you this evening and the Institute of Black World um, 21st Century. I was asked to come before you this evening to all of you great individuals um, that sit on the panel and who join us this evening and to everybody that's in here. How many of you are everybody? Somebody in God's eyes. Y'all do know that, right? Okay. So I was asked to invoke God's presence. As I was preparing um, to come here this evening, I thought about Dr. King, and I thought about him being a praying man. So in the spirit of Dr. King, I want to share with you that we know that he was a crier for strength to carry on the work of peace and justice for courage to be nonviolent, come what may, for blessings on the movements for civil rights, justice, and peace, for healing for the oppressed and the oppressors, and for the coming of God's reign of peace, love, and nonviolence here and now. Pray with me, if you will. Oh God, we thank you for the fact that you have inspired men and women in all nations and in all cultures. We call you different names. Some call you Allah. Some call you Elohim, some call you Jehovah, some call you Buddha, some call you Jesus, but we know that some call you the unmoved mover. But we know that these are all the names for one and the same God. God, we thank you for the lives of our ancestors and prophets in the past who have revealed to us that we can stand up amid the problems and difficulties and trials of life and not give in. We thank you for our foreparents who've given us something in the midst of the darkness of exploitation and oppression 
to keep going. Grant that we will go on with the proper faith and the proper determination of will so that we will be able to make a creative contribution to this world in the name and the spirit of our God. Eternal God, out of whose mind this great cosmic universe, we bless you. Help us to seek that which is high, noble, and good. Help us in the moment of difficult decision. God grants us that we go out and face life with all of its decisions as we face the bitter cup, which we will inevitably face day by day. God grant that we will learn this one thing, and that is to make the transition from this cup to nevertheless. Thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, our souls, and our minds, and we have not loved our neighbors as God has loved us. We have kingdom of understanding where men and women will live together as brothers and sisters with dignity and worth of every human being. God, we thank you for the inspiration of God and all that he has given to us. Grant that we will love you with our hearts, souls, and minds. We ask right now, God, that as we invoke your presence into this place, that you will keep our minds, keep our hearts, keep us where we need to be, keep our focus, that we will stand with each other, that all that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for will not be in vain. We ask right now, God, that as you cover the people in this room, that you bless each household, that you cover each one from the crown of their heads to the sole of this, their feet. Bless this event, God. Bless this city, God. Bless our mayor, God. Bless our state, God. Bless our country, God. Bless each and every one in this world, God. Keep your arms of protection around us. We pray, oh God, that you will be in all of us to strengthen us, beneath all of us to support us. Go before all of us to guide us. Keep your arms of protection around us. Keep your angels encamped over us as a shelter. We will be careful not to take credit for nothing that you have done, but say, God, you did it, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, in the name of Allah, in the name of Elohim, in the name of Yahweh, we have prayed in the name of our Creator, and everyone in agreement with me said, Amen, amen, amen. amen. and amen. amen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. With Allah's name, God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, we praise Him, seek His aid, His assistance, His mercy, and His guidance. We greet you with degrees of peace. Assalamu alaikum. That is the peace that God gives, peace be unto you. We have it here for an economic summit, e economic symposium, striving for economic dignity. We've been praying for a lot of years. Now we want some results of that, monetary results. So this is an economic summit program as well. And those were the last thing that, um, that our beloved Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King was making his last few speeches. So we say, Lord, as we gather here today for this historic event, participating in this economic summit, striving to make Newark a model city, I call you to mind a number of verses from the Holy Quran. Allah says in Quran, He frowned and he turned away. Yes, many people frowned and turned away from Newark, Lord. They plan, and the law plans, and the law is the best of planners. A law has decreed that one from amongst us, born and raised in Newark, a product of Newark, be raised for the occasion and lead this city into prosperity. We are praying for the Honorable Mayor Raj J. Baraka to continue in his vision. We are praying to share in this victory and share in his success and share his vision. Now, under the leadership of the Honorable Mayor Raj J. Baraka, Lord, we are here to witness over $2 billion worth of development in the pipelines. And you say in the, you say in the Quran, nothing is omitted. So there's something in the Quran about Newark. What does God say? He says in the Quran in chapter 34, the chapter called Sheba, the queen of Sheba. Between them and the cities on which we have poured forth blessings, 
We have placed cities in prominent positions, and between them we have appointed stages of journeys in due proportion, travel therein secure by night and by day. We are praying for the prominence of Newark and its safety and its security by night and day. O oh Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, all is between above and beyond. We thank you because you told us that if we are grateful, you will give us more. This is what you tell us in the Quran. We are striving to keep the balance between our developing the soul and the soil. We want to develop the, the, the soil and see big buildings come up, but we want our souls to go up with those buildings in a righteous way. And God says in the Quran, Ya alidina aminu alaykum in fusikum. O ye who believe, be regardful of your souls. So we are regardful, Allah, of our souls. We are developing spiritually and materially simultaneously. I conclude with this prayer, the number one supplication that Muslims make on a pilgrimage to Mecca. While circling the Kaaba, the house that was built by Adam, our father Adam, and rebuilt by our father Abraham and his son Ishmael, the one supplication, the number one supplication that we make when we go on around that Kaaba is this, Rabbana antina fi dunya hasnatin wa fi akivati hasnatin wa kithatha benar. Our Lord, grant to us the good things in this life and the good things in the next life and protect us from the punishment of the fire. As we duplicate Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, walking and running between Mawa and Safar Mountains, the number one supplication that she made, Rabbana antina fi dunya hasnatin wa fi akivati hasnatin wa kithatha benar. Our Lord, grant to us the good things in this life and the good things in the next life and protect us from the torment of the fire. O oh Allah, bless this city. We ask you, bless the Honorable Mayor Raj J. Baraka. Bless the, the, the Honorable City Council people led by their beloved, our beloved Councilwoman Mildred Crump. Bless the City Planning Board. Bless the schools from preschool all the way to the universities. Allah, we understand. Whosoever controls our children's education controls our future. Thank you for giving us local control. O oh Allah, bless the police department and the fire department and all the other departments. Bless its citizens and its visitors. Amin. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, I think we have some people join us, right? The Honorable Raj J. Baraka is in the house. Our UN ambassador for the, Af the decade of African descent and much more, Danny Glover, is in the house. <laughs> Moving right along, the occasion. And I'm going to be quick with this occasion. I just want to remind people, how many of you, you were here for State of the Black World Conference number four? All right, okay, great. Hosted right here. And we did that intentionally, by the way. That was not by accident. And by the way, we had the most effective, most dynamic, most energetic planning committee of anywhere we've ever had a State of the Black World Conference right here in Newark. They did an incredible job. <laughs> we, we came to Newark because, again, of the legacy and the history of this city and because we embraced the policies that were being advanced by a progressive African-American mayor. And in our sessions today, one pointed out that not every mayor, I'm, you know, and this tell no lies, tell no, claim no easy victories, not every African-American mayor is progressive. Now that doesn't mean that they're bad, I'm just saying they're not necessarily progressive. But when we find mayors like Antoine Chokwe Lumumba in Jackson, Mississippi. <clears throat> we find mayors like Mayor Roz Baraka, it, in, it behooves us to surround them. And so that's why we came to Newark. But not only did we come to Newark, we said we'd be coming back to Newark. Because in our declaration of, uh, of intent and call to action, we said 
among other things, that this mayor had called for an urban Marshall Plan, <clears throat> a domestic Marshall Plan. We knew that others had done likewise. We said that we wanted to embrace that call. But we went a step further. We said that with all of the wealth of black America, its talent, its, its resources, what if we decided to focus those resources intentionally on a particular city, that that could have potentially miraculous, powerful kinds of consequences. And so we talked about the concept of Newark as model city, but we also wanted to bring, therefore, from all across this country, some of the brightest and best minds to provide technical assistance if needed to supplement, not tell people, to supplement and complement, to exchange ideas, but also people who might want to invest, who might want to partner with what's going on in this city. And I'm telling you, it's exciting. I'm getting ready to move to Newark. I mean, this is like, this stuff, I'm getting excited up in here. When I talk to, to, when I talk to director, I mean, acting director, excuse me, sorry, acting director Carmelo Garcia, I'm ready to roll. I'm excited about what's happening in Newark. So that's the backdrop. That's why we're here because we believe in Newark, we believe in the Honorable Rosbray Baraka in terms of what he personifies, and we are going to continue. We're going to continue until we've achieved the objectives that we've set out. So now what I want to do quickly do is do some acknowledgments, because we want you to know uh, folks who've come from around the country to be with you today. When I call your names, um, and there'll be some who had to leave, but I want those who are here uh, to just stand when I call your names, whether you're in the audience or uh, on the stage. Uh, Randall Pinkett is no stranger, he's here. <laughs> stand, remain standing, remain standing. And y'all can hold your, hold your applause. And, and he, he's, of course, a brilliant uh, brother. He's the CEO of BCT Partners and winner of the NBC's Apprentice when it made sense to do The Apprentice. And by the way, to his credit, he made it, he made it clear that he does not, he's not with the orange man. He made that clear. Uh, not here, but who was here recently, he, she had to go back, was the uh, Rochelle Morgan Cesare. She is the, the analyst for the office of Mayor Karen Freeman. She's not, wasn't able to be with us. Stay, stay, stay standing, stay standing. You young brother, you can stand for a while. Michael Roberts is here, chairman and CEO of the Roberts Company from St. Louis, Missouri. Doctor, and that's Dr. Michael Roberts, by the way. He, he's owned like 14 hotels, radio stations. He is on Black Enterprises, multi-billion dollar. I don't want to make him too rich, but he'd he, 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 he be heavy, right? Dr. Ntangalizi Sanyika, who's the community and economic development pioneer. <laughs> Dr. Charlene Sinclair, Director of Re Reinvestment for the Center for Community Change. Uh, Clement Sinclair, who is a program associate for the Center for Community Change. <laughs> Stephen J. Smith, executive director of the Public Policy Institute, the National Rainbow Coalition. <laughs> Dr. H. Ahada Stanford, the director of neighborhood and business development from Philadelphia. <laughs> Shango Taha, senior community economic development planner and of Kamasi Development Associates from Washington, D.C. The Reverend Dr. Jonathan Weaver, founder of the Collective Empowerment Group from Baltimore. <laughs> Kyle Williams, director of the Financial and Housing Policy of the National Urban League. <laughs> Dr. Zachary Williams, professor of African American History, University of Akron, and, and the coordinator of IBW's Resource Consortium. <laughs> Did I get everyone? I think I missed the page. Let me go back up in here. Hold on, hold on, we'll get them all. Oh, by the way, he's not here, but we had Dr. Bernard Anderson here, the Whitney M. Young Professor of Management and Emeritus at the Wharton School of, of Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. He's heavy. He was here. <laughs> Willie Barney, President of and Facilitator of the African American Empowerment Network, Omaha, I mean, uh, Omaha. <laughs> right? Juan Busby, National President of the National Black Chambers, is in the house. 
Donald Cravens was here, executive director of National Urban League of Washington Bureau. He's not here, but they give him some applause anyhow. <laughs> Reverend Dennis Dillon is in the house, senior pastor of the Rising Center in Brooklyn. <laughs> Dr. Devin Fergus, distinguished professor of history and black studies at University of Missouri. He couldn't be here because his father's from Newark and he just had to go meet his father and say hello to him while he was here, but give him up. Dr. Nishani Frazier, Associate Professor of History, University of Miami, Oxford, Ohio. <laughs> David Harris, Executive Director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard University was here. Let's give it for him anyhow. <laughs> Byron Hobbs, Senior Organizer, Center for Community Change is here. Chicago, Illinois, that is. Seth Hunter, Executive Director of Community, Com Communities Creating Opportunity, Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas is here. <laughs> Nataki Combo, Small Business Development and Management Consultant is here from D.C. <laughs> Willard Lett, Community Economic Development Practitioner from Manchester, New Hampshire. So he's coming up there where there ain't many black people up there, but he's here. Don Maxwell, former executive director of the uh, Prospect Business Association from Kansas City, Missouri, is here. <laughs> Shia Mehta, Policy Center for Community Change in Chicago, Illinois, is in the house. <laughs> I think I got them all. I think I got them all. If I missed any, forgive me, but let's give them all a big round. These are the people who've come to support Newark. These are the people who have come to support Newark. Give them a big round of applause. All right. Now, we also just want to quickly um, give some other shout outs quickly, quickly, quickly to our esteemed president of city council, the Honorable Mildred Clump. Let's give her a big round of applause. And one of the brothers who's here, humble, he worked with us actually on the State of the Black World Conference. I hope he's still in the audience. He was here very early. But he's one of those unsung heroes, perhaps. He was early on doing incredible work here in the community. Reverend Henry Code. Code, I'm sorry, Cade, I'm sorry, Cade. A central Presbyterian church. Is he still here? He was here earlier. He actually came and he wanted to identify uh, with this activity. Uh, others who are in the house, um, is the United Africa Congress has not arrived yet. It has a delegation that is coming. Um, Barbara King, our dear beloved sister Barbara King. She's the African Commission. I think I saw Pam Africa in the house. I think I saw Frederica Bay in the house. And I'm sure there are others that we'll be able to uh, acknowledge as we proceed with the program. In fact, um, I don't know whether he is, uh, he is here yet, but one of the persons who stepped forward to be helpful in terms of sponsorship uh, is Brother um, Mike Dakotas. I don't know if he's here yet, but we want to give him a shout out anyhow. When he comes, we want to give him a big acknowledgement. We really appreciate that very, very much. Okay, now moving to the program right along. We now have coming for a musical rendition, Professor Jaquia Jackson of the Pleasant Grove Baptist Church here in Newark. Give it up for her. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage when the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth, his mark. Genoin. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
glory, glory. Hallelujah. His truth, his mark. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching. On. We sing glory, glory, hallelujah. Come on, you can sing that with me. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory. All right, all right, that's a skiff. Very good moving up in here. Now, we selected that song because, as you remember, you may recall, Dr. King ended his mountaintop speech with a reference to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So, that was an intentional selection. And let's give it up for her again. What's a beautiful rendition that you wrote? And now we have two presenters who are going to bring succinct remarks on King's journey for economic justice and its relevance to black America today. And I say succinct because we're moving the program along and I had them pass me a microphone up here so when I tap that microphone that means uh, don't, don't get, you know, don't, you know just because y'all know I will step, you know, so be succinct, right, because we got a whole program to get done this evening. To incredible people, Nataki Kambone is co-founder of Let's Buy Black 365, senior consultant of New Business Solutions from Washington, D.C. She is a dynamic sister. Followed by, and I forgive me because I gave the wrong chamber, and I, I don't want to disparage anything, but I'm glad I'm correcting this. Ron Busby is president and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers, which is distinguished from what I said previously because there's a little difference in political orientation. I'll say that much. And so come. Nataki Kambon, give it up for her. All right, uh, in the tradition of our great African ancestors, I'd like to ask permission from an elder to speak. Madasi and Asante Sana, and thank you, depending on from where you are. Um, again, my name is Nataki Kanban, and uh, although I was raised in North Carolina, I was actually born right up the road in Brooklyn, uh, New York, so it's nice to be kind of home. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here tonight. I know we have a short period of time, so I had this whole presentation presented, and Dr. Daniel said, you got to abbreviate. But um, I'm honored to be here as we commemorate the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and as the co-founder and national spokesperson of the Let's Buy Black 365 movement, uh, definitely want to welcome all of you uh, from Ghana, West Africa, I want to say uh, uh, Akwaba, 
uh, but uh, I bring with you or bring to you greetings from the organizers, the activists, the business owners, the students, and all of the members of the Let's Buy Black 365 movement who are in spirit with you today because this is the culmination of several years of work to create the black economic empowerment that we are always talking about. Uh, in November 2016, I had the honor of convening uh, and facilitating, excuse me, the economics plenary for the State of the Black World Four. And what was most striking to me about that is that it wasn't just a conference. The Institute of the Black World and Dr. Daniels was very clear on the directive that we cannot just have a conference and leave and go home with a good feeling. We needed to take that call to action and organize around it and create real sustainable change in the black community. And so over the last few years, there has been a strong contingent of individuals who participated in that who have worked on a plan to do just that. Uh, one thing I did want to note and remark is that um, in January, we did a call to action where we asked people to not just celebrate Dr. King's birthday by marching and demonstrating and going to events, but we asked people to live Dr. King's legacy through living his mountaintop speech message of economic empowerment and living the message to economically withdraw from entities that do not support our communities and to redirect our dollars, not just to black owned businesses in terms of black faces, but the committed black owned businesses that are interested in reinvesting in building community. Uh, and although that message was echoed 50 years ago when we put that call to action out, I would remark that one of the things that strikes me most is not what happened in January, but what happened in the black community and black world in February. Because surprisingly enough, in the middle of February, uh, there was a phenomenon that happened. And that phenomenon was that a film was released and millions and millions of black people <laughs> took millions and millions of dollars and took them to a movie theater to watch a film about a fictitious black nation that had fictitious wealth, resources, and superhero-like powers to do amazing things for their people. And what is most striking about that is not that we took money that we could aggregate for black liberation or aggregate against a system of racism and white supremacy, but what strikes me most is that we are so desperately starved to see our people rise that we will do it even if it means seeing it on a film screen produced by people who don't even like us. So what excites me about being here today is that in the convening of the symposium that took place earlier, in the convening of the town hall that's taking place right now, the history that you are a part of here is the Institute of the Black World, Dr. Daniels, has assembled a group of black experts, black leaders, uh, community builders, uh, city planners, mayors, and activists who are all ready to put our best and our brightest together so that we don't have to think about fictitious cities. We actually can create real model cities with black people and black resources. And I think that's something we need to get excited about. So in close, uh, before I go, I just want to share that one of the things that I'm excited to share that the Let's Buy Black 365 movement is bringing to this conversation uh, is in uh, earlier this year, we came up with a plan for how we were going to join both the business community and our local communities. And we launched an initiative where we put forward 
a million dollars of resources to help black owned businesses grow from the mom and pop small business level to the enterprise level to create legacy businesses. Yeah, we need to clap for that. <laughs> Because one thing that we know and that we recognize is when we have legacy businesses, those businesses have the ability to change everything in our daily lives. They have the ability to influence policy. They have the ability to create jobs and allow people to own housing and allow people to have some reprieve from a system that may not be or that is not for them and create a system that is for them from within. So with that, I'm excited that the Let's Buy Black 365 movement is a part of this conversation about a model city and how we can bring businesses that are not, again, not just black owned, but committed black owned businesses by those who have the consciousness about what communities look like when they're created with an intergenerational ideology in mind and created with the knowledge and understanding that as we grow wealth, we also need to help our communities mend the psychological trauma that has happened from hundreds of years of racism and white supremacy. We also need to build on models of intergenerational sustainability. And with that, I, will, I see Dr. Daniel standing here. So with that, I just want to leave you, I want everybody to chant with me. We have a mantra that we say uh, at Let's Buy Black because we forget that we each as individuals have so much power to create the change that we want. So say this with me. I am the resource my people need. I am the resource my people need. I am the solution. I am the Let's Buy Black 365 Black Economic Empowerment Movement. I am the Let's Buy Black 365 Black Economic Empowerment Movement. Thank you, Madasi. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not going to ask y'all to repeat anything, so you can. Uh... Good afternoon or good evening. Um, I am truly honored to be here. Thank you, Mr. Daniels, as well as the panelists. Again, my name is Ron Busby. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers. A lot of people are talking about Dr. King's death 50 years later, and many of us have heard his mountaintop speech. And it starts at 13 minutes going forward. We don't really talk about the first 13 minutes of his speech. The first 13 minutes of his speech goes a little something like this, and I know a lot about our leader, Reverend Jesse Jackson, because in that speech, Dr. King leads, leads, looks back and says, Jesse, what's the name of that bread company? And Jesse says, it's Wonder Bread. And Dr. King says, we're going to stop buying Wonder Bread. He leans back and he says, Jesse, what's the name of that cola company? And Jesse says, that's Coca-Cola. And he says, we're going to stop buying Coca-Cola. Danny, I'm from Oakland, California, and I'm really honored to be here. You see, I grew up in a two-parent household. My mother was a teacher as well as a minister. So I'm well-educated. I know who my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. Hold on. Because I also was blessed enough to have a father, and my father was an entrepreneur, but he was also a Black Panther. So I'm about business, and I don't take no shit. <laughs> the U.S. Black Chamber was founded in 2009, and when we started, we had six chambers. Today, we have 135 chambers. We're in 31 states, and we have a membership base of over 293,000 black-owned businesses. Before starting the U.S. Black Chamber, I lived in Phoenix, Arizona. And while I was in Phoenix, I had the opportunity to live in a city where there was only 3% black population. In 2002, I had, was married with two sons. And on July the 7th, 2002, my wife died. 
left me with two young boys, five and six years old, and I prayed, Lord, I feel like Satchel Paige. I know I got one more inning in me, and if you give me the opportunity, I promise you, Lord, I won't let you down. Kyle and I was just talking a little while ago, and he said, man, how do you stay single? <laughs> and I said, well, I moved to Washington, D.C. with two of my sons and started the U.S. Black Chamber, and I am all about the mission of our organization. You see, we were based on five key pillars. Hold up, because I know Mr. Daniels is going to ask me to stop for a moment. You see, our first one was advocacy. And when I moved to Washington, D.C., I was driving down the road, and I looked on the back of our license plate, and it literally reads, taxation without representation. And for African-American business owners, that's who we have been. We have been paying into a system that does not represent our best interest. When I first moved into my office in Washington, D.C., literally right across the office, right across the hall from me, was the Sugar Beach Growers Policy Organization. Everybody's got somebody representing their best interest, except for black business owners, until now. Our second, our second issue is access to capital. You see, there's a lot of conversation about e-commerce. But that's not us talking about e-commerce, because you see, 40% of African Americans don't have a bank account. We don't have credit cards. And so we're talking about getting into the new commerce. It's leaving us out. Without credit, I can't get an Uber. Without credit, I can't get a Southwest Airline ticket, or rent a hotel, or rent a car. You see, the new commerce is about having the ability to exchange via without cash and it's leaving African Americans out. I was watching the NCAA football championship and 21 times Samuel L. Jackson said, what's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? You see, the average African American is paying more than 20%, 19.8% for credit and have to have a 650 credit score to apply. That's keeping most of us out of the game. The U.S. Black Chambers has partnered with our black banks around the country to provide a credit card for African Americans with credit scores as low as 570. Let me say it again. For credit scores as low as 570 with an interest rate as low as 9.96% interest. That's how we deal with the solution of consumer credit. But I deal with business owners. And so we went back to the SBA and said, that's great for up to $10,000. But if I'm a business owner, I need 50, 60, maybe even $100,000. And so we were able to convince, no, we were able to advocate to the SBA to now provide up to a 50% guaranteed loan up to $100,000. The largest challenge that we have is collateral. Because we know, and a lot of folk have been talking about it over this last couple of days, we lost our homes when the recession hit. So we don't have the collateral that we once had, but now through a black-owned bank, you can get the funds that you need to start your business. And our third one is contracting. Let me say this real quick, because you see, a lot of folk have been talking about the trillion dollars that we have. But well, that ain't black folk talking about the trillion dollars. That's white folk talking about, we got a trillion dollars, how can we get their piece of the game? Our conversation is how do we keep that trillion dollars in our community? And so I'm happy to say that we have opportunities like Buy Black 360, but I also have a mobile credit, I have a mobile app with 107,000 black owned businesses in there. You can no longer say, I don't know where you are, because it will tell you when you get close to it, it will ping you. I have 36 different categories, it's GPS driven. So anywhere you go in America, Africa, Brazil, or the continent of Mexico, you can find black-owned businesses that you can spend your money. We monitor what the government is doing, what corporate America is doing, and most importantly, what are we doing? I'm sorry, I, I know. Our, our fourth one is entrepreneurial training. I graduated from two HBCUs. I went to undergrad at Florida a and where we strike and strike and strike again, and I went to Clark Atlanta University Graduate School, but there will be more African-Americans that will graduate this year from one university versus all of our HBCUs combined. And that will be the University of Phoenix. And a lot of folks will be like, ah. Oh. Or we can say, let's join them. Because you see, 
the challenge is, and I'm in D.C. where we have HBCUs, they're monitored on the old system, and that is butts in seats. As a business owner, I'm not going to go to a college. I got too much work to do. I got to take care of my children. I got to make bills. A lot of us have gone to college four, five, six years and never graduate. We have partnered with the University of Phoenix to give you online training to be able to make you a better business owner. Thank you very much. The last thing I want to say, a lot of folk have been talking about making America great again. We believe in making America great again as well. But in order for there to be a great America, there's got to be a great black America. And in order for there to be a great black America, there's got to be great black businesses. And in order for there to be great black businesses, they need you. They need you to get off of the dime and spend money with them. They need you to stop asking for the homie hookup. Pay the people the, pop, the prices that they need so they can hire additional folks. Thank you very much. Good night. All right. Ron Busby. We got some great folks now. They could go, I mean, you know, I'm just, we're just giving you a taste. These people are going to continue to be linked to Newark, by the way. So they'll be back. But, you know, we're just giving you a, 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 the appetizer tonight because we're going to do the main course as we move forward. I'm honored to see that uh, our Paramount Chief has honored us with his presence. Our Paramount Chief is none other than Dr. Leonard Jeffries is in the house. <laughs> Dr. Leonard Jeffries is in the house. Right, I'm with it. Also with him is Dr. Akil Kafani. Dr. Kafani, thank you for joining us this evening as well. And so now as we get ready to hear from our uh, keynote presenter for this evening, we want to introduce that by way of another musical selection. <clears throat> and that selection will be rendered by evangelist Ruby Annette Evans, who's with the province music group from here in Newark. Would you give her a big round of applause as she comes? I'm in heels this evening, so I'll do what I usually do and take them off. <laughs> I give honor to God, to this distinguished panel, panelists, to my mayor, to none other than the president of the council, my dear sister that I love so very much, to the, I see some of my other friends and I say hi and I say hi, to my sister Salimu, I just love you so very much. I was asked to do this particular song and it meant so much and I was reading the words earlier this afternoon and um, I said, gee, you know, I know when I first heard this from the musical uh, Man La Mancha. But more than that, it tells a wonderful story in words. So I will say to you, my sisters and my brothers, let's listen to the words. Not so much what, how the voice may sound, but the beauty of the word. To dream the impossible dream. To fight the unbeatable foe. To bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong, to Pure and chaste from afar To try when your arms are too weary To reach the 
unreachable star This is my quest To follow that star No matter how hopeless No matter how far To fight for the right Without question or pause To be willing to march into hell For a heavenly cause And I know If I only be true To this glorious quest That my heart Peaceful and calm when I lay to my rest, and the world will be better for this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach to reach to reach to We gotta give the piano son, Pastor Jerry Williams. He played it. Right, give the piano son, Pastor Jerry Williams. And we thank again Reverend Louise Scott Roundtree because I went to her because you know we 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 vibing now since the State of the Black World Conference. I said we need two people to sing, so she said, I got it. Did she have it? Let's give it up again for these two dynamic soloists. Let's give it up for them. Tremendous. And so now, brothers and sisters. Yeah, there's a car, H HCU, 4655, New York Plates. You better move or it will be moved. HCU, 4655, uh, has to be moved. All right. All right. Okay, now, is everybody all right? Are we having a good time? Are we celebrating Newark? All right, that's what we're here for. And so now it's my distinct honor to introduce our keynote presenter. He really needs no introduction. He is recognized for his work throughout the globe. It is not by accident that he has been appointed to be the UN ambassador for the decade of African descent. He's like a blur, constantly on the move, indefatigable. In fact, 
you know, we, we worry about him, but he just keeps moving because he's committed. Back from the days when he was a student at San Francisco State University helping to create the Black Studies Movement, people like Sonia Sanchez. He's an actor of great significance. I was with somebody the other day and they said, oh, is that Danny Glover? I remember him. Yeah, that's Danny Glover. But acting does not define Danny Glover. That's not who Danny Glover is. Danny Glover has always been about serving his people. And so the other day I heard he was in Venezuela dealing with the issue of African descendants there. A couple of weeks before that, I was trying to catch up with them, and he was in Honduras, Costa Rica, uh, moving through those, Guatemala, moving through those countries. And so now he's back in the country, and he's coming into us now from Newark, where they asked for him. They needed him. They wanted him to be there because of what he represents. He will spend the night with us, and then early in the morning, he's off to Washington, D.C. That's Danny Glover. That's Danny Glover. And he don't show up just for anybody. He shows up for those persons and policies that he believes in, that advance the vision of those things that he holds dear to his heart, and those things for which he has dedicated his life. And he is dedicated. He's one of the most remarkable human beings we have among us, a treasure for people of African descent. In the spirit of Paul Robeson, he doesn't like me to say that, but I just can't otherwise. It's been branded. He's in the spirit of Paul Robeson. Would you please welcome our keynote presenter, Danny Glover, UN ambassador for these of African descent, actor, activist, and humanitarian, Danny Glover. To the city of Newark, New Jersey, the Honorable Mayor Roz Baraka, yes. and to those city officials who serve this city as it navigates its way through its own transformative process, I want to thank you all those from Dr. Leonard Jeffries, to everyone here, I see so many people here. And, and I'm, I'm glad that and I have the opportunity to be with you and to talk about, I think, so many things. There's never enough time to, to talk. You know what I'm saying? His young sisters, his young brother up here had something to talk about, and we didn't have enough time for them, you know? Because this moment that we have here, this moment recognizing Dr. King's legacy, his untimely death 50 years ago tomorrow, a moment where we find to gather our senses, to gather ourselves, to find ways in which we, we carry on that, him being that symbol in that moment of what was just and what was to do, what we had to do, the work set out to do. We remember that he was organizing sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. Men who stood up and said, I am a man. We realized that he was doing that at that, at a, that critical moment in the organizi organizi organizing of the strike itself and the participation and, and the heroism of those men who stood up as well. We also realized that he was down in Alabama just a few days before talking to sharecroppers in Alabama. He had moved across the country talking to sharecroppers, talking to poor people, black, white, Hispanic, Native Americans, 
Asia in the service of organizing a poor people's march. Sometimes we have to put all the dots together to understand where we're translating this. We know that a year before, April 4th, 1967, he gave the speech that most people feel was his, his death sentencing beyond Vietnam. There he took his triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism, and say, if this is the thing, this is the, this is robbing the moral spirit of this country. This capitalism, this system that had come into existence at the beginning of the 19th century, one based on plantation capitalism, that's what it is. We know that. Within 40 years, within the first 40 years, of this country's existence. It became the most wealthiest country in the world from 1800 to 1840, the most wealthiest country in the world. Built on the blacks of slaves, built on their backs, created on their backs. So we, 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 we look at this, all this, this an amazing information and we look at ourselves right here in the age of, I don't say return of racism, <laughs> but the blatant existence of it, the realization that it never did go away, the realization that we still had battles to fight, the realization that, that we have to, to determine where we stand on the issues of justice, where we stand on the is is issues that affect all of us, humanity itself, right here. We sit in here looking at not only black people, but humanity itself. And while King talked about that, he knew, he knew that his purpose and his mission and his, was to save the soul of this country. I think about this moment in terms of the work that's here, the work that's being done, the intricate work. I'm one of those, I would just say, one of those young people who came to the Model Cities program and the Office of Community Development in 1971. With all its great ideas, all the ideas of transforming, of empowering people, empowering communities, and transforming those communities in that. I came to that, that moment in San Francisco, California. Little did I know that there was another plan in place. And whether those plan, that plan had the, had the approval, stamp of approval by black politicians or not, it was in place. It was called gentrification. It had been called redevelopment when I was in, at the Western Edition Community Organization in 1966 as a 20-year-old young man just attending to find out what was happening to a traditionally black neighborhood, the Fillmore. The Fillmore that I lived in, the Fillmore that I grew up in, I just saw that change overnight. People were disempowered to the point now that the population of black San Francisco, you can take the whole population of every black person in San Francisco, put them in Pac Bell Park, which sees 43,000 people, and you won't fill the park up. That's what has happened. They've been moved to the outskirts. So taking all this into consideration, taking all this into consideration, the role that we play as citizens, the role that we play as elected officials, the role that we play in community building, building businesses is essential. Community businesses in the past wasn't Starbucks. Community business was businesses that were connected to what was happening in the community. If there was a strike in the community, they were involved in the strike. If there was some uprising in the community, they were involved in it. They were absent. They were absent from what was happening in those communities. So if we talk about this moment, in this realizing this moment, in this moment where we saw enormous, we saw the Great Recession and the impact that it had 
not only on black people, but specific, specifically black women. Black women were the, whole, the hardest hit by the, the housing fallout. And we have to realize all these things as we move into developing the, our narrative. What is our narrative? What is the narrative that we're going to talk about? It's going to include the work that you're doing right here, but there's going to be a simile, a, an assemblage of other ideas as well that would nurture us and nurture us in a different way. We don't know what those ideas are. We don't have any idea because imagination is extraordinary. Our imagination and our ability to transform, to make, make those things happen as individuals, collectively, as citizens. We, we, what we're doing, when we do that, that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about a number of things here. We know what the Marshall Plan was. We know about the Marshall Plan, how it rebuilt Europe. The United States was the only economy left intact after, the World, after World War II. So what it did was it created for, for, for the United States and U.S. plantation capitalism. This is what it created. It created the golden years of U.S. capitalism from 1945 to 1975. That's what the Marshall Plan was built on that. Not only you building, rebuilding Europe, you are also rebuilding Japan as well and the rest of the world. So established the, they established a new set of wealth in this country. By the end of World War II, 75 percent of the wealth was, by, was owned by the United States. Right now, over 75 percent of the wealth is owned by corporations. That's the reality, in that sense. It determines whether it wants to destabilize a small government or it determines whether it wants to stabilize, destabilize a, city, a, a city. It does all of that. And when we think about those ideas, take in consideration the march that we have, the journey that we've been on. Like I said, I came with the Model Cities program. What did the Model Cities program do? It provided all those who were graduating from college, who were the baby boomers, an opportunity, a job. Not unlike in 1948 when my mother and father came to the post office. How many people in here, parents, cousins, daddy, mama, everybody worked at the post office? Almost everybody in the country. We had somebody who was connected to the post office. It provided this, it, this bridge for those who were uh, assimilating, who had been victimized and, and also who had, had, had been disenfranchised an opportunity to get into the idea of the quote unquote American dream or whatever. So those things happened. So it did that. It provided that space. King understood clearly in his speech in November, on April 4th, 1967, he said clearly when he talked about the war in, war in Vietnam, how he was eviscerating and he used eviscerating the, 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 the anti-poverty programs, the war on poverty, as he said. Those monies didn't go for that. They were going for killing Vietnamese. That money should, to, to which it, which should be designated for what we needed to do, what needed to happen, what really needed to happen in this country in terms of doing justice and doing right by African Americans was now finding itself wasted upon war. We see the same thing happening today. In fact, he had gone to the office, the budget of office affairs, and came up with a number, a, a number in terms of how much it would take to do justice to African Americans, former slaves, in that plantation capitalism itself. So we understand that it could be done. We saw it done in Europe. We saw what happened in Europe where it raised the, the levels of health care, the Marshall Plan. It rebuilt the whole structure. In fact, you almost want to think that they bombed and devastated everything in order to so they could rebuild it and, and use that as a platform in order to increasing their power and increasing their wealth. So we, 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 what is that narrative that we need to talk about? How does that narrative involve committed elected officials? These men and women here, the mayor here, committed for real change. How do we find, not only that, how do we find an international bridge with other countries and other communities as well? How do we build those relationships with what's happening? 
You look at Brazil, you have, you have the landless movement, MST. The landless movement in Brazil has placed significantly over 450,000 families on abandoned land. That's over 1.45 1, 1. million people that they place on land. How do we connect with them? Because there's a narrative there. It's a narrative for transformation as well. So as we talk about this, what is the narrative for transformation? You know, I was in Venezuela. As Venezuela was last week celebrating, commemorating the 164th year since the abolition of slavery. Now you count that, that had to be in 1854. When did the U.S. abolish slavery? 1863, January 1st, 1863. I, that's when they abolished it. At least the decree came out there. But well, we know what happened after that. <laughs> and subsequently, what happened with that. So, so on the one hand, I was in a community called Balavento. Balavento. Primarily African descended communities. It grew its own cocoa. It, 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 it took that cocoa and made chocolate with it. And it built a viable community there with relationships that go, went beyond just the making of chocolate itself. With relationships that were much larger than that. They had begun the process of transformation. King always talked about what is the road to transformation? What is the pathway to transformation? Not simply that we have a job, not simply that we have been successful in what we do in terms of our business, but what is that transformation? What is that process for transformation? We need more and more to talk about that, to add, add that as leverage in what we do as work. For the work that we do now, in the legacy of King, of all those foreign, all those who have left us, all those who, who have, 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 have given so much of their own time, sacrifice and everything else, what does that transformation look like? And how do we create a world that works, a city that works for all of us, not only a city that works for all of us, but a state that works for all of us, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. That is our task. We have to find that narrative. And it's, it's a dynamic narrative. The contradictions have changed, whether they are. Even though we see the manifestation of Trump and we pay a lot of attention to what he's tweaking and everything else, the real transformation will have long before Trump came into power. What was happening, what were the changes that were happening? The re, 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 the reinstitution of racism, the breakdown of the, the, the society itself, the breakdown of all those things that the New Deal brought. The New Deal brought all these particular things, put them into place, and every moment since then, it's been an attempt to undermine it. The voting rights side, all those things that dissuade us to be real citizens and active citizens in our own rescue. Active citizens in our own rescue. So that narrative has to include that, include that as well. So these are moments that, that, that we have to take serious, to think out, find ways to collaborate with all aspects of hear, listen, grow, and build. Thank you so much, man. You remember I didn't show with you to <laughs> Danny Glover! Danny Glover! Whew, boy, it's getting gooder and gooder. Wow, you know what I mean? I want to acknowledge a um, delegation from the United African Congress uh, led by the national spokesperson for that organization that has come over from New York as a part of the Pan-African Unity Dialogue that we convene, uh, the Honorable Sadiq Y, and the representatives of the United African Congress. <laughs> Sadiq Y, it's in the house. So now we want to have our panel discussion. I need a watch. Uh, my watch stopped and so I gotta, somebody gotta provide me with a watch so I know what our timing is because we want, don't want to hold you too long. But we do want to hear from these brilliant folks who have assembled in terms of having a conversation. And it will be a conversation. We're gonna ask them to respond to particular questions 
And, you know, if they get the Holy Ghost like Ron Busby did, I'll have this, I'll go. You know what I mean? That's, that, that means, you know, you know what that represents, right? And again, among the things that we're attempting to do is to talk about Newark. But beyond Newark is how do we replicate a process that can transform not only black America, but at the heart of it is black America, but also transform this nation. That's about, that's what, and we have that capacity, and that's what we're talking about. And so I want to begin with our two Newark residents, and with all the pop people stand up in the house, you know, y'all, you got Chairman Hammond, you know, y'all, pop people's organization for progress. Y'all know y'all be showing out. All the pop people in the house be popping up. All right. Okay. So we ask you to be crisp in your responses, and, and I wanted to start it with you, uh, Larry Ham, and then subsequently with Pastor Ronald Slaughter, whom I have the privilege of meeting today. I heard so much about him in terms of the work that he's doing. So I want you to share with our visiting resource people who are here your perspective on the progress that's being made here in Newark, but also the challenges, you know, in terms of of what, it, how, what the challenges are uh, in terms of the effort to make Newark a model city under the leadership of the Honorable Raj J. Baraka. So again, my question is, you know, to share, you know, because they, they, they want to hear from you. You're our local panelist. Uh, what are, again, some of the, your perspectives on the, the progress that's being made, but also the challenges? Because it's never easy. It's never like without some contradiction. So, oh, I need the microphones. Where are the microphones at? Give me the, oh, the microphones up here. Let's get the mics up. Okay, now we're going to get them to you. I'm sorry, I had to, I had to, didn't want y'all to get started too soon, so. We've got a preacher and got, Larry Ham's a preacher too, so. All right, y'all wanna, you, you wanna test yours? Oh, you, you good to go. So, Larry Ham, start us off. Power to the people. First of all, let us give Dr. Ron Daniels and the Institute for the Black World, 21st Century, give him a big hand for having this economic forum. And I must say, in the interest of full disclosure, because I don't want anybody to be under any illusions as to where I stand, and I just want to say that the People's Organization for Progress, we endorsed the candidacy of Ross Barack in 2014, and the People's Organization for Progress endorses the candidacy of Ross Baraka and his entire team in 2018. I, um, we stand forever in the vortex of history. And as our beautiful singer was giving, rendering the impossible dream, I can remember being in West Kenny Junior High School in the fall of 1971 when we were preparing for the National Black Political Convention and we had the Essex County Black Political Convention at West Kenny Junior High School and Congressman Fauntroy from Washington DC was the guest speaker and that night he sang Dream the Impossible Dream right. And here we are today, and now the son of the man that convened the National Black Political Convention 
is the mayor of the city of Newark. All right. So now you have three minutes to answer the question. That was my three minutes, right? <laughs> let, let me just say quickly on the question of economic development that we're having this forum today is fortuitous because yesterday was the anniversary, in fact, the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Economic Cooperation Act by Congress in 1948, which created the Marshall Plan. So it's right, it's been 70 years since 1948 when the Marshall Plan was created. It's actually tonight, it's today. That's, this, this April, is no, April 2nd is when Congress passed it. Oh, okay. Congress passed the Economic Cooperation Act, okay. All right. April 2nd, 1948. But the, the point I'm trying to make is this, that the Marshall Plan enabled the rebuilding, and not just the rebuilding, the revitalization of Europe after the devastation of World War II. They had a Marshall Plan in 1948. We need an urban Marshall Plan for our cities in 2018. And what that means, and I fully support all self-help efforts, but we have to be clear on what the Marshall Plan was. The Marshall Plan was the investment of billions of dollars of public funds into the economic development of Europe. And we need, instead of spending a trillion dollars on wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, we need to use that trillion for an urban Marshall Plan for our cities and to revitalize Newark, New Jersey. So I think that the administration of Ross Baraka has put us on the right path. But it's going to be a difficult path because the development of a city takes place within the parameters of the American capitalist system. And that system is designed, in fact, to impede our growth and development. So while we do the best as we can at the local level, having the best government that we can possibly get, having the best administration of our city, we have to do what Dr. King challenged us to do at the end of his life. And I urge everybody when they leave here today to read his fifth book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? And in the chapter, the ninth chapter, titled The World House, Dr. King said that we need a radical redistribution of power and wealth in this country and that we need a radical transformation of our socioeconomic system. We needed that in 1968, and we need it in 2018, because black people are in worse shape in this country in 2018 than we were when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. All right. My three minutes. Yeah, you, you, you came in on time. All right. So Reverend Slaughter, you, you, you pastor a congregation. So you have folk in the congregation who, you know, they're they not necessarily interested in all the lofty speeches and all that. They, they want to know what, you know, Mr. Say ain't nothing, Mr. Do is everything. So they want to know what's happening, what's going on. So, and you are yourself involved in doing some economic enterprises yourself. So from where you sit, how do you see uh, Newark's development plan unfolding? And what do you see as some of the challenges? Well, first, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this panel. It's kind of hard following Uncle Larry Ham, but I do the best that I can. Um, as it was said earlier, I was so happy to hear Brother Glover talk more about King's speech in Memphis than his speech in Washington. 
because most of us have begun to sanitize the life of Dr. King and relegate it to nothing more than I have a dream speech. When he was much more than just that. In fact, uh, when he talked about the need for housing and the economic epidemic in this country uh, while he was in Chicago, and the need for blacks to have affordable housing and places to live and also places to work in order to be on a level playing field. From a faith perspective and from a spiritual uh, perspective, I believe you need faith and spirituality in order to bring about change in the community and transformation. And so along with partnering with our mayor and partnering with uh, the city, we don't need more church buildings, we need more transformative centers. And that's what, um, if we listen carefully to what Stefan Clark's auntie was saying the other day on national television, and she was referring to her nephew who everybody's criticizing uh, because Stefan Clark's brother's running around and people have all types of things to say about him. And what she said is we need resource centers to get persons the help that they need in our urban and inner cities. And so I believe under our mayor's agenda, our mayor understands that we can build downtown, that's good, but he also believes that we must revitalize the urban communities and the blightedness in those communities. And so I have uh, proudly uh, partnered with our mayor uh, to bring about that type of change uh, in the inner city. And then finally, uh, most of us have heard about Nehemiah. We've read something about Nehemiah. I just so happened uh, to finish a complete dissertation on Nehemiah and the work of reviving the urban blighted areas of our community. I'm glad I'm graduating. I'm done with that doctoral piece next month. Uh, but in researching all of that and going through that, Nehemiah was more than just a spiritual personality. Nehemiah was a revitalizer. And only, when we only relegate him to being spiritual, we minimize his impact. In fact, the uh, scholar Walter Brueggemann once said to Nehemiah, he's the greatest urban redeveloper that the world has ever seen. That implies Jerusalem was urban at the time that Nehemiah undertook that assignment. And because I preach everything from a black perspective, then Nehemiah's skin must have been darkened by Mother's Nature's son, which means he was a brother that said to the government of Jerusalem, you all contributed to this blightedness. You all need to help fund this blightedness. You need to help fund the turnaround in the city. So I believe the resources we talked about earlier in our sessions, that we must hold the government accountable we talk about reparations nobody have no problem with that they have billions of dollars and we need to make sure it is allocated to our inner cities that we turn our inner cities around and we follow the vision that our mayor has set before us thank you so much Thanks. thank you appreciate it I now like to turn to a friend who has come from the, the city of Philadelphia dr. H uh, Ahada Stanford. She's the Director of Neighborhood and Commercial Revitalization from Philadelphia. And I'd just like you, from your own experience, to share uh, with our brothers and sisters here on the panel, but also brothers and sisters here from Newark, uh, what lessons they might learn from the work that you're doing, you know, in, in Philadelphia. What lessons can you share that might be useful? Or maybe it's some of the difficulties, but whatever in your own voice, please share that with us. Well, this is a field trip for me. I'm learning. Speak I'm a little louder. You, you, you're so soft spoken. This is Speak a field a trip for me. This is really a field trip. I absolutely am learning. And in fact, I've just been sitting here trying to absorb it all. It's just so absolutely wonderful. Maybe the last time I was here was with Ntangalizi and the Congress of African People folks and, and Imamu Baraka and, and talking about social organization and, and we talked about cities, you know, but one of the things that gets lost in cities is where we live, our communities, our neighborhoods. That's where our assets are. That's where we grow the wealth of our families. And that's really very important. And, 
And so revitalizing downtown has gotten to be the thing. And it's happening. It's happening all over the country. But revitalizing neighborhoods is something that we have to make happen. And it will only happen when we make it happen. When we decide that it's important that to own those assets that are in our neighborhoods. When it's important to shop in our neighborhoods. It's important to grow businesses in our neighborhoods. And that's the kind of thing that I've been doing and that's the kind of thing that my team does in Philadelphia. We go into commercial quarters and there are CDCs there working doing housing, but we work in the commercial quarters, supporting the businesses, working with CDCs, planning, analyzing the real estate, doing development, and we'd love to see that happen here in Newark. And, and I know it's happening, but I think that we could probably share some lessons with you. And so I'm going to keep trying to learn what I'm learning so that I can share some lessons with people here in Newark. Okay, how wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Willie Barney, you have traveled all the way from Omaha, Nebraska. I didn't even know there was black people in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Actually, that's where El Haz Malik El Shabazz was born. And I had the privilege in 1990 of being a part of what we call 1990, the year of Malcolm X, and we went to Newark for that purpose. Let me just say that Willie Barney, in my estimation, has put together in the city of Omaha one of the most phenomenal organizing economic and community development projects anywhere that I know. And I, 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 this, I specialize in trying to find these things. So Willie, would you just share your sense of what you're doing in Omaha and how it could be potentially success, I mean, helpful in terms of what's happening here? Uh, in Newark. I just first want to say that this is our time. It's not by accident that we're here at this time in this city. This is our time. And I say that because I am a full support of the Marshall Plan and the model city here in Newark. Because we rebuilt Europe, we rebuilt Japan, we're rebuilding Iraq. We might as well rebuild right here. And What's interesting is, I'll talk quickly about Omaha, but I'm so impressed by what I saw with the mayor and his administration, uh, the state of the city. It, they know what to do. They need the resources to take it to scale and to accelerate the pace of the work that they're already doing. And so, as much as we need a Marshall Plan, um, we also need a Montgomery Plan. And what I mean by that is in Montgomery, the people engaged, they were educated, they empowered themselves, and then they pursued excellence in an economic sense. And so what we've been pursuing for the last 12 years in Omaha is bringing together people from different sectors, starting with us, engaging in the society, and then educating ourselves on where, is the, where are the existing funds? Where are the dollars? How are they used at the city, state, county level, federal level? How do we reallocate strategically to make sure that we're using those resources in our own community first? That's where we start. And then we identified that we needed to have elected officials in place that supported that bigger community bottom-up vision. And that's where we have now three uh, school board members. We have the city council president. We have the county commissioner. We have the Douglas County treasurer. We have two state senators that are aligned to a community-based plan, which is being redeveloping in our own community. And so I'm here in support of the larger vision uh, of a nationwide effort around the Marshall Plan. I'm in support of this mayor and the administration of the work that they're doing here. And I, I just want to, uh, the reason I say it's our time, it's not by accident that 50 years ago the Kerner re Report came back and said you have to invest at the scale of the problem. It's 50 years since uh, Dr. King was taken from us. And now here we find ourselves in this very moment, and I'll share with you very quickly in Omaha, using some of the very same plans that the mayor's administration has laid out, our graduation rate has gone from 50% to 81% to Af for African Americans. Our gun violence rate in the summer, when our kids have jobs, when our kids have jobs and positive activities and they're working with the churches, our gun violence rate is down 80% 
in the summer months when the kids are working. Graduation rates are up, gun violence is down, and we are now beginning to really marshal and align resources, collaboration, alignment, and strategic reinvestment. This is our time. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Charlene uh, Sinclair, you're a native of Newark and doing incredible work you know, around the country, but you, you and the Center for Community Change are focusing on this question and, and how we need to move. So share with us your sense of what work you're doing and how it might in fact be um, helpful and instructive to what is happening here uh, in Newark. So uh, good evening. I am a native of Newark. It was, it's wonderful to be home and to see this kind of energy and excitement. And, and I've been trying to figure out how to get back to Newark for decades. So this feels so good. So thank you all for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm a community organizer. That's what I do for a living. And that means that we get all into the business of what is disrupting the thriving of our people. Mm. And part of the work that we are doing around this country and why I got into community organizing is as a native of Newark, I left Newark at 17 pregnant trying to raise a kid. And somebody knocked on my door and said, why are you living in this roach infested, rat infested tenement? And that's how I got into this work transforming the place I lived in. And that led to me understanding that I needed to transform the city, the state, the country, and eventually the world. So part of what we need to be doing is to recognize that the local is also the national, is also the international. And so a lot of the work that our groups are doing is working deeply in communities with residents, actually building up projects and building a work on the basis of what those communities have determined that their needs are. So from the places in Missouri where Seth is coming from, where they're looking at social determinants of health and actually building a narrative that the work that we're doing is not only about making life a little easier, but actually showing that the deep generational poverty that we're living in is actually resulting in the death of community members at 10 to 15 years than that of people in other zip codes. That's what we're dealing with. We're, this is not just a, a narrative, a rhetoric. This is the reality of the fact that our people are dying as a result of this. So people are organizing around the country to actually take back infrastructure, in Detroit, they're actually working to make sure that the water infrastructure isn't bankrupted and taken and privatized so that they can own the actual system, the water system, the $1.3 trillion asset in that community can stay in that community. So in Ohio, they're working on a crime um, ballot initiative that will actually reduce felonies, not only because they're interested in criminal justice and keeping people out of prison, but a recognition that if you have a felony, you cannot get a job. If you are pouring money into the carceral systems, you don't have money for schools. You don't have money for any kind of mental health, anything. So that's why they're doing that work. People are actually moving and we're coalescing around an umbrella of black safety, liberation, black thriving, black freedom. And so that's the work that we are moving forward. Now the challenges that we're facing, and I'm going to use two examples for challenges and then I'll be quiet. The first example, because I'm sitting between two men of the cloth, is what I tell myself, the place that I go to is actually the book of Revelation. Book of Revelations, chapter 18, verses 11 through 13. People talk about verse 11 because they're talking about all these luxury goods, all that we create just to sustain the materialism of the, the country, the materialism of the imperialist movement. And then it says, and we also sell body and souls. And then people get upset, body and souls. But they never go to the next line where the people that are crying are the merchants. The people that are actually getting their livelihood on this system. And so we need to be careful that when we're actually moving to, to, to make life better, we're not 
reinscribing, making, deepening, creating the very same systems that mean our death in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful about that. And the second quick example is because this is Martin Luther King, we're, we're celebrating you know, his vision and we're talking about his martyrdom towards that vision, remembering in that spirit also that in the last retreat with SCLC, when he talked about the Poor People's Campaign, when he talked about economic redistribution, the people around him said, wait a minute. So while we're in this room, the question is, who will you be? Will you be the people that cry because your livelihood is now threatened because we need to upturn this entire system? Or will you be the people that stand with King and say that we have to do the work, even to the point maybe of death for justice, not just death to support capitalism. Ooh. All right. Mm. All right. Randall Pinkett, uh, you from these environs from Newark, and you've been very successful, and you're you're a very committed and uh, social entrepreneur associated with the Frasionet, vice president of Frasionet. What, share your thoughts about, as you travel the world and what you're doing, how we can be of assistance uh, to the city of Newark. So there's a lot of income in our communities, but there's not a lot of wealth in our communities. I'm gonna say it again, somebody said that's true. There's a lot of income in our communities there's not a lot of wealth in our communities. And I believe that if we're going to design a Marshall Plan for the city of Newark, that Marshall Plan has got to focus not on just creating greater income, but creating greater wealth in our communities. Greater wealth. I've been a business owner, believe it or not, for about 25 years. I've been a business owner in Newark for the past 14 years. I moved my business from Plainfield, New Jersey to Newark in 2004 because we wanted to be a part of the economic transformation that was happening in Newark and has continued. Uh, and I got to give credit to our mayor, Raz Baraka, who has really made moves in terms of a vision for how we can really economically empower the city of Newark. So shout to Raz Baraka for his work and his vision. But to quickly tie together a few things that have been said uh, by Brother Glover and by others, uh, and Brother Ham and, and, and Ron touched on this and Nataki touched on this. So in Dr. King's last book before he died, Where Do We Go From Here? The book that he wrote just before, that was released just before his assassination, at the end of the book he says the following, and Brother Ham made reference to it. I got the exact excerpt. He said the following at the end of the book, and be, be mindful that in the last numbers I checked, there were about 40 million, uh, 45 million poor people in America. So keep that into context. Dr. King's writing. I want to say to you as I move to my conclusion, as we talk about where do we go from here, that we must honestly face the fact that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million people, poor people here, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you are raising a question about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you must begin to question the capitalistic economy, the words of Dr. King. If you round up every single millionaire in America and ask them, how did you make your millions? From the lottery, from inheritance, from savings, from stocks, from bonds, seven out of 10 will tell you they made their millions by owning a business, by owning a business. So the only way we restructure this society, the only way we transform Newark is by creating more successful business owners. And that's two ways. The first is teaching our young people that you don't just have to go get a job you can own something in this city. I'm a first generation entrepreneur. I started at the age of 18. That's why I've been in business 25 years. 
I started in college at Rutgers. I have no one in my family at Shouster Rutgers who had ever launched a business, but I had a friend who was 21 who launched the company. I said, if he can do it, why can't I do it? The second thing is, for those of us that are in business, show of hands, how many entrepreneurs here, past, present, or future, in the room? All right. I see you proud, brother. I'm not mad at you. The second thing I do is, we have to support existing business owners to accelerate their growth because, and I'm going to close on this, 98% of all companies are small companies. 75% of jobs are created by small companies. Black-owned businesses have the highest likelihood of employing black people. So if we want to create wealth, we want to create jobs, we want to transform Newark, we need not just entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs who do not forget where they come from. And when they make that money and build that wealth, they reinvest the money back into the community. That's what we need. All right, okay. And, I, and, and, and I'm looking to launch, last thing I'm gonna say. I'm looking to launch, and we've been talking about this, and this is my commitment to Newark. We're, we've been, we're looking to launch a black business accelerator program that brings together the anchor institutions, Prudential, PSE&G, Verizon, all the big anchors, Rutgers, NGIT, and translates their spending to more local spending with local businesses to build the local economy to create local jobs and local opportunity. That's what we're working on right now. So that's my contribution to the Marshall Plan. All right, that's like concrete, all right? Okay, let me just say this. Growing those businesses, you heard Nataki Combo, right? I'm connecting the dots. She says she is about taking mom and pop, and I'm not saying that disparagingly, small businesses that, are, that have 100,000, 100, she's saying she's willing to be here in Newark to help scale them up to million dollar, multi-million dollar. That's what her commitment was. Nataki Combo. Uh, next, I want to go to Mike Roberts. Michael Roberts is, I've already described, is phenomenal. Uh, he is, uh, maybe I already told this story, but he's the kind of person who owns radio stations, a bunch of other things, but as I think I may have said this earlier, I'll repeat it. Uh, when Chokwe Lumumba, the father of Chokwe Anta Lumumba, was running for mayor in Jackson, Mississippi, he essentially quietly said, you got my radio station. Do what you got to do. And that's, that's an in-kind contribution. That's like, that's like a lot, right? But that's his consciousness. And he's been willing to do that. He's been willing to work with people to help build businesses all across this country. So Mike, Michael Roberts, would you be, Dr. Michael Roberts, would you be so kind as to share your sense of the, the opportunities and the challenges um, in terms of what you would be saying to brothers and sisters here in, in Newark? Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Danny, no. uh, my, uh, my daddy worked at the post office for 39 years. Uh, we weren't rich, we weren't poor, we just never had any money. I think a few <laughs> other people probably would know what I mean by that. And incidentally, he, he turned 95 in, in, in uh, October, and the same week he turned 95, he went and got his driver's license renewed. So that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And my mom is 88, they've been married 70 years. So that's another testament to uh, what it takes to build an institution. I have uh, I've built several hundred companies. And uh, we did some math the other day and we've employed in our years uh, close to 11,000 people. 99% were African American. I've owned about 14 hotels. Uh, actually, I've owned about 12 TV stations as well as a radio station. Uh, at one point, I owned three city blocks in downtown St. Louis. I'm from St. Louis. I live in St. Louis. Uh, similar to what's here. And Muhammad Ali said it ain't bragging if you could back it up, so I'll speak freely to my family here. I think that we have to recognize a few things quickly. One. Every day when we wake up, we're given 86,400 seconds. That's an existential view. We have to look at living every moment to its fullest extent. So we have to work all the time. Mr. Mayor, one of the things we have to do is we have to be disruptive. 
we have to disrupt our minds from what we think and the way we've been taught, and we have to replenish it with the fresh new ideas. In business, there's all types of things breaking. You've all heard about bitcoins and cryptocurrency and blockchain and, and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, drones and cyber uh, security. Everything I've named will be business opportunities that will translate into billions of dollars for you if you disrupt your thinking. Because blockchain as we know it will want, sooner or later replace the internet as we know it. Now that's how deep it is, and I dropped that on you only because it's my responsibility as a futurist to begin to say that. I built a wireless phone company in Missouri. It was a digital phone company when everybody else was still on analog phones. You remember when the coolest person in the theater had a phone in their briefcase? You remember the snap, crackle, drop? <laughs> and now everybody has a phone. I've taken three companies public. One of them was my cellular company, and Sprint bought it. Uh, and I say that because most of you don't know Mike Roberts or my brother Steve Roberts. I understand you don't know us, but do you know why you don't know us? It's because rich people scream, but wealthy people whisper. <laughs> now, Mr. Mayor, let me tell you a little story. About seven years ago, I looked at Detroit and I realized that we had all kind of problems. We had the mayors going to jail. We had uh, disruption of a different type. And I went there and I looked at a little hotel on the Detroit River, it was owned by the Omni people. And they decided that they were gonna board up and leave Detroit like everybody else. I decided what I would do is come in and buy that hotel. Why? Because 93% of that community was black. And my position was, if I build something great and beautiful, our people will support it. Danny Glover has been at my hotel, and we have enjoyed some time together there. Today, it's one of the best hotels in the country, and unfortunately, I say it this way because now I'm the only African-American hotel owner in the city of Detroit. With all those black folks doing all these things, we still don't own very much of anything which is what my brother here is saying. We have to develop wealth. What is wealth? Wealth is something that's sustainable, generational. I have four kids. I made sure like they went to law school like me, all four of them. So as hard as I've worked and I've been all over the country, I'm the largest African American developer in the Bahamas today. I say that because somebody has to set examples. When I bought a hotel in downtown St. Louis, there was a time at that hotel they didn't want blacks to deliver the mail at that hotel. I then bought that hotel. And my daddy worked at the post office. <laughs> and next door to it was the Orpheum Theater. They didn't want, when my mama told me that they used to not let them in and then eventually we would sit in the nosebleed section, I bought that theater. And then my mama could sit wherever she wanted after that. <laughs> It is nothing like the concept of developing wealth because a brother with money can stay, sit up here and say anything he wants to and not be afraid of anybody being able to take it away because we are smart as a people and we are loyal as a people and we stick together. But we have to understand the value of ownership. I heard this recently at, at uh, George Frazier's program Check this one out. There seems to be something wrong with the brother who owns a Land Rover but has a landlord. Let that one sink in for a moment. There's something wrong if you own a Land Rover but you have a landlord. I wrote a book, Action Has No Season, and in that I talked about the various companies we built and the philosophy behind business. Everybody in here has a book. You need to write about your story. Pass it on. Don't let it go six feet under. Let us all know your stories, because we all have very interesting stories. Let's make sure that we become more actionaires. That's a coined word that I have in my book. It's one who takes their ideas, their dreams, their vision, and their passion 
and they pursue them with courage and confidence and bravado. An actionaire is an interesting word because I would hope that someday it hits the dictionaries of Wikipedia or something along that line. Because usually black folks, our words are words like bling bling and bootylicious. I mean, we just don't, you know, those are the kind of words they attribute to us. We need to have intellectual concepts. So in closing, let me just say that in those 86,400 seconds, let action be a part of your everyday concept when you wake up. Uh, become that actionaire and pursue your ideas and your dreams. And don't just sit back and talk about it, act upon it. Let the concept of breaking the old thoughts and bring in the concept of disruption and look at these emerging business opportunities because when we do that, we will win and we'll be extremely successful. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So now I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Zenzeli Dillon, who is the global president, global president of Marketplace uh, Calling International, MCI. Uh, and she is from Zimbabwe and from Brooklyn. So we'd like to ask her, from your international perspective, uh, the possibility of connecting, actually, entrepreneurs and people who are interested in investment and around the work that you do that might in fact contribute again to the development here of Newark. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ron Daniels. From Soroi, that's what we say in Shona, which means please allow me to speak before the elders. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the great work that the mayor is doing. Uh, the president, uh, thank you so much, and the whole leadership. Um, so Africa is, uh, is the happening place. Why am I saying so? Um, the African Union recognized the importance of Africa diaspora to be part of Africa. Therefore, it has been recognized as uh, the sixth economic regional community. So we do have five regional communities, which is the Southern African Development, uh, Southern African uh, Regional Community, which is SADAC, We've got the ECOWAS, which is the West African, the East African, the Central African. Now it is the Africa diaspora. Why is it important? Uh, I, I think most of you would know. Uh, there's been a narrative on Africa, you know, Africa rising. Africa is not going to fully rise until the Africa diaspora come back home to build Africa. So I'm here to say, Africa is waiting for you. Uh, Mayor, as I am sitting here, I am part of Newark. Uh, I might be living in Brooklyn on the continent, but I'm saying I'm part of what you are building. Uh, whatever help is needed, I'm there. Whatever you need on the continent, I'll run to the continent and make it happen. So, Africa has got uh, resources. 75% uh, uh, of, um, of uh, the, uh, the, the, the global cocoa market is produced in Africa. About 50%, uh, over 50% of gold across the world is coming from Africa. About 65% of diamonds, they are coming from Africa. Why is that we are buying diamonds diamond rings from Tiffany. <laughs> Why can't we set up a Tiffany here in Newark? <laughs> and we call it, we give it our own name. And we start buying our own diamonds. And we start processing our own diamonds from the continent. Uh, what is quite interesting is the, 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 the diamonds, they are not in the hands of the black people. The black people are the workers. The owners are sitting somewhere in London and the, they are trading the same way they traded the slaves on Wall Street. Where the slaves were used, you know, the, our ancestors, I don't know if you know that, but they were used as collateral for security, as security for loans. That's what used to happen on Wall Street. 
So Africa is waiting for us. We cannot sit here and come again next year still talking and talking and nothing is happening. So it has to go beyond a conversation. And I strongly believe that uh, this conference is actually the beginning of us coming up with a plan to cross over so that we start owning and occupying land and owning businesses. And the businesses that we are talking about, we have to think bigger than, you know, mom and pop type of uh, businesses. Africa has got, uh, it needs, uh, you know, machinery. Where is the equipment coming from? Where is the equipment coming from? Here I'm talking about the yellow goods. Where are they coming from? They are coming from elsewhere. Yet we are sitting here. Maybe uh, a challenge to my brother with an app, with all those business people, they need to come and connect here in Newark and then connect on the continent. And let's set up maybe uh, what I would call an economic processing zone. Right. Uh, I don't know about, uh, you know, most of us, if we know that there was a... Okay. <laughs> Uh, th there was an act that was promulgated in Washington, which is called the AGOA, the Africa Growth Opportunities Act. Why is that we don't know anything about it? Because it was not meant for us. That's, that's right. But it's meant for Africa. To do what? To exploit Africa. So we are going to rise up and take dominion and start collaborating with the continent. But then... Some people, they don't have a good story about, you know, business opportunities. Maybe connecting with the wrong people. We do have an opportunity. There's a platform where we've got a gathering of Christian business people. Every year we meet. Let's come, let's connect across the, across the globe, including America. So the America-Africa bridge, it is open. It's waiting for you to work on it. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Our final, our final presenter, if you will, is an incredible faith leader who is doing amazing work. He is all across uh, the country. He is the founding president of the Collective Empowerment Group from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. I, I saw him rocking in his chair. He was getting the, the spirit up in here. So would you please share your thoughts again about the work that you do and how it might be helpful and empowering in terms of what's happening here in this great city of Newark. Reverend Dr. Jonathan Weaver, would you please give him a round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels, and good evening to everybody and to the mayor. You are doing an exceptional, extraordinary job leading here in the city of Newark. I think we ought to give him another great big hand. God bless you, sir. Let me just, and Dr. Daniels, thank you so much. Um, I, I do believe in collectivity. I believe it's so important for people to gather together. We are much stronger when we come together than to try to do things individually. And so about 24 years ago, because of an experience that I had at my own church, uh, getting discriminatory behavior from a local financial institution, uh, after being told that uh, the bank would consider giving us a $50,000 loan after we had simply paid off a quarter of a million dollar loan in four years. And then the response from the financial institution was when we asked for a $50,000 loan, we'll consider it. But you will have to put up your building that you now own free and clear as collateral. And that three of our trustees would have to personally guarantee the loan. It was with that in mind that I turned around and composed a letter to the president of the bank. I don't mind telling you it was Bank of America. I'm just keeping it real. I, I, I wrote to the president and at the end of the letter, after describing the 30 year history that we had with the financial institution and its predecessors, I said, and our 750 members will be very disappointed to learn of the response from the bank. 
I mailed that letter on Tuesday, on Friday, coming back to my office. My assistant said, Pastor, you got an urgent phone call from the executive vice president of the bank. I called to the bank, and uh, that individual said, Reverend Weaver, I'm in receipt of the letter that you sent to our president, and I just wanted to let you know that your loan has been approved. <laughs> I clearly understood why. The president saw numbers. I was fully prepared to stand up on that Sunday if necessary and say, how many of you in this room have an account at Bank of America? And when they stood up, I would have said, take your money out and put it in another institution. Fast forward because we have not a lot of time here. Ultimately, out of that, the vision came to not just focus on Greater Mount Nebo, but what can we do for the larger black community? And as a result of that, as of today, there are 150 churches and other faith leaders that have comprised to make up the collective empowerment group. We now represent in Prince George's County and the Washington metropolitan area 250,000 people. And therefore, we then created a, a brand new paradigm. No longer were we going to be asked questions by the bank, but we asked questions to the bank. And so as a result of that, as a result of that, they have to compete for our dollars. And part of that, as I fast forward, is that we insisted that somebody from our ranks would have to sit on the board of directors of any financial institution that has our dollars. I'm, I'm happy to tell you, I'm happy to tell you this evening that one of those institutions, Industrial Bank, the oldest black bank and the only black bank in Washington, D.C., now has somebody not only sitting on their board of directors that has come from the faith community, but I happen to be chairman of the board. But, but here's the significant thing. Here's the significant thing. Since the beginning of the collective empowerment group back in 1995, and remember now, this is not about Baptists, it's not about AME, it's not about Church of God in Christ. It's about trying to empower our people. Forget about doctrine. And as a result of that, because those financial institutions, but primarily led by the Black Bank, over $250 million has been loaned to black folk to buy houses. Because if you're going to create wealth, in many instances, it's got to start by having a home where you create some equity and then are able to turn around and start a business. So that's what we've done. But also we have strategic partners, black businesses. Let me just give you a couple of quick illustrations. One, Freedom Paper Company. Freedom Paper Company. You need to know about Freedom Paper Company. I believe they're already up here in Newark somewhere. And as a matter of fact, the majority of their employees are brothers that have come out of the correctional system. I think we ought to celebrate that. The second one, Brother Danny Glover, to your point about the fact that we need to be creating bridges. There's another company that actually, anybody here know David Robinson? Well, you may not know David Robinson, but you know Jackie Robinson. Yes, his son David has lived in Tanzania now for the last 30 years. He's a part of a cooperative for coffee growers, women in particular, Sweet Unity Coffee. You can get it online, and there is a warehouse facility there in Brooklyn where they're helping to process the coffee. You don't need to go to Maxwell House. You don't need to go to Starbucks. You can support Tanzanian women in this cooperative by going online and getting Sweet Unity Coffee. It's about empowerment. It's about generating wealth. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, would you now please welcome to the rostrum our beloved brother, the visionary. He's fatigued. I see he's tired, but he ain't no way tired. Too young to be tired, bro. The Honorable Ross J. Barack. Let's, let's give, give it up, please, for Dr. Ron Daniels, please. His tireless commitment to, to making this stuff happen is unbelievable. He gets this done over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, we 
are forever grateful for him. And I, I'm just excited about this entire panel up here as well. It kind of uh, reiterated some of the things that I yell and scream and fuss about all day to the folks who work in City Hall with me all the time. They got to hear other people say the same things that I say. And, and so I was elated uh, to hear you guys, even you know the Freedom Paper Company, it's folks that we trying to work with now, lighting the fire on the people to make them understand how important these things are. Uh, we set an urban Marshall Plan, and, 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 and in my head, uh, you know, some of this stuff sounds contradictory to people, but you know, all contradictions are not antagonistic. You know, there's something called the unity of opposites, right? How would you know that you was male if there was no female? If there was no down, it could not be up. If there was no right, it could not be left. So opposites unify, uh, it actually creates balance, and that's important for us to, to understand. So there's only two things that uh, we need to do. As a mayor of a city, there's only two things that I do every day that I try to do. There's only two things that I say over and over again when I go around at this point now. Uh, and I said it earlier today uh, to a smaller room, and the, the, the first thing is to create a, a city of brilliant, beautiful, courageous, uh, you know, uh, folks that are willing to challenge and transform a system uh, in order to make it represent everybody, right? And two is to keep them alive long enough to do that. And, 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 and that's important. Uh, it's important because it deals with two things that we, we've been talking about. So we're, we're trying to challenge a system that is designed to keep us in poverty. And, and so where we live, poverty is an uh, integral part, is an ingredient for a system that we're in. Poverty is an ingredient. So I want us to understand exploitation is an ingredient in a system that we use to function every day. Racism and white supremacy has become an ingredient in that system. So meaning that you can't have that system unless these ingredients exist. In fact, when you pull those ingredients out, the system changes to something else, right? And so we have to have people that are smart enough to A, understand that, and B, work every day to transform that into something that's different than exists already, right? Uh, and then the, 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 the second and most important piece as a mayor, uh, so I got the regular job of, you know, fussing with people about snow, about potholes, about garbage, which every mayor has to deal with, but I also got to stop people from dying, right? From, from things from, uh, you know, violence, self-inflicted, violence from police, violence from poverty, violence from infant mortality, violence from mental illness, violence from poor education, violent, violence from poor diet and poor health, uh, 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 violence for poison in the air, poison in the food, poison in the water, violence from all of those things. So I have to mitigate those things because we live in a system that has created that, right? And so we're trying, and those things seem dialectical, but they're important. So on the one side, you have to create opportunity for people in this system to keep them alive. Because if you don't, they will die. Right, and because there was no democracy, nobody voted for poverty or who gets to be in poverty, it's privileged to say poverty needs to exist and we have to wait till somebody figure out how to get rid of it. And, and, and in the meantime, what are the people that are in poverty going to do since you're not one of them? Right, so we, we have to figure out how to pull as many people out of that as we possibly can. That means we do have to create jobs. It means we do have to create wealth. It means we do have to change uh, the, the material conditions of people's lives immediately, immediately, like tomorrow. We have to do that. And then second, we have to understand that that also has to be tied to a, a, a huge transformation of entire system where we get rid of poverty altogether, right? And so that's, that's why Urban Marshall Plan is important, right? It's important because we can't fix these problems off our goodwill and, and good looks, right? We actually have to infuse resources in our community, and we need public dollars and public commitment to make that happen. Uh, and that's democracy and self-determination. Democracy because par part of the taxes are ours, right? So we're talking about commodities and exchange. It was a time when we were the property, when you were the, the wealth. We want wealth, but you were the wealth at one point. You, you, your body was the wealth. So we, so we have graduated from that part, at least to say we need some more wealth. And so we need an infusion in our community. And it was said earlier today, the Marshall Plan was not just about creating jobs and wealth in the community. It was also a political document 
that was about making sure uh, they create uh, and sustain institutions of Western democracy and capitalism throughout the world, right? So that also was a part of what the urban, mar what the excuse me, the Marshall Plan was about. So we have to have an urban Marshall Plan that's designed to uplift the people in these communities, train them, give them uh, employment, build wealth, uh, allow them to ha have entrepreneurship if necessary, spend their money where they want to spend it. All of these kind of self-determining things, uh, give their kids better schools, training, knowledge of self, all the things that we need to survive in our community long enough and, and then we need to have at the base of that the kind of uh, uh, undercurrent that says that we're doing this because we want to transform this whole place right and, and that's that's what what we mean by urban Marshall Plan uh, they spent 13 billion dollars in Europe which today is equivalent to over 100 billion dollars right so if we had a hundred billion dollars to be spent in our community what would we do with it how would we sustain that uh, and, and how would that continue to multiply itself, right? What, what would that look like? What do we, what do we want to do with $100 billion uh, invested in our neighborhoods and invested in our community that was purposely disinvested in our neighborhood? There's, there, we, the, the state is willing to give $5 billion and we'll create uh, tax credits and money. We're willing to create that and give it to the private sector to invest in our community. And, and, and that's a contradiction, but it's something that we'll take for the present. But we have to think about how do we force them to turn around and give a similar $5 billion package to a community to publicly? How do, and, and see, the fight with that is, you know, the, if you ask the state to do that, the, the, the people around the state would, do, would come and uprise against you because they're not willing to invest $5 billion of their, of their money into your community, communities of poor working people of color. They're not willing to do that. So that's going to take a struggle. We can't even get them to spend funding for schools equally. Right, so if we say we need $5 billion of tax credits, of public money invested in Newark, Irvington, East Orange, Trenton, Camden, if we need, we need that tomorrow, we'd actually probably have to have a fight. A real one. A real one in, in order to get that to happen. That's the contradiction that we have to understand. And I'm going to get out of here, but the Ur Urban Marshall Plan is, is something that we all should be saying. And that's why I love Dr. Daniels, because he un understands that all of us on every sector of our society, you know, you know, we need to be saying we need an urban Marshall Plan. Every talk show, every radio show, we need to call it whatever we want to call it, but we need to be saying, uh, you know, arguing on our, on, on, on our uh, entities, we need an urban Marshall Plan. Not arguing with each other about, you know, uh, there's garbage on my block. We need to be arguing about how do we create an urban Marshall Plan, right? How do we create a system that's designed to compensate us for 250 years of free labor uh, 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 disenfranchisement, lynching, abuse, destruction of our family, systematized uh, uh, undermining of our economy in our cities, the murder of our children, the poisoning of our water, uh, uh, housing that is poor, dilapidated and destroyed, p uh, homelessness on, on our street, poison in our community, bad education in schools that are crumbling uh, at, at their foundation, guns that have been put in our community, drugs that have been infiltrated in our neighborhoods, uh, 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 cities all over America that have been destroyed purposefully, deliberately, and systematically while we blame one another for the outcomes of that, we don't blame the people who created the sickness in the first place. Yeah, so I, I say to people, you know, this system is like a musical chairs. And, and we're running around trying to get chairs. And the problem with musical chairs is that it ain't never been enough chairs, right? And so they got you believing that you have to listen to a specific song or maybe you should run faster or do some push-ups or exercise so you can run faster and get in a chair before this person. But the real trick is it ain't enough chairs. And so while we fight with each other about how to get these chairs and who's responsible for the chair and why you didn't put the chair here versus the chair there and why we at the council meetings beating each other up about what the chairs look like, how big the chairs is, how small the chairs are, how wide the chairs are, nobody has ever said, hey, wait a minute, there's not enough chairs. And we don't want to play this game anymore because the game is intrinsically flawed. We want a game where there's enough chairs for everybody, right? 
and if, if we had a, a game where everybody had a chair, then we all could sit down without killing and beating on one another, right? Never mind if the chair is dirty or clean or red or blue or black or tall or short. Damn it, we just want enough chairs. That's it. And that's what the Urban Marshall Plan is designed to do, provide an opportunity for us to create enough chairs. And I, and I think our young people are smart enough, because I'm not at this point in my life, to figure out how to dismantle, transform, and create a system that's equitable. So my job is not to create a new game. I'm the mayor of the city. I'm not here to create a new game. I'm, cre I'm here to prepare young people so they can create a new game. And I got to provide them cover fire so nobody don't kill them before they come up with the idea to create the new game. That's all my job is. And if I get to do that, I will die a happy man that some of these beautiful young people create an opportunity of a game that we all can play with. Nobody gets uh, uh, put out uh, and I keep them alive long enough. I'm the sniper on the roof with the long barreled gun that are getting killed, shooting everybody. I'm the Tuskegee Airmen that's protecting the bombers as they fly in to bomb the whole thing. I'm keeping you alive long enough to fulfill your mission. God bless you. The Honorable Roz J. Baraka. The Honorable Roz J. Baraka.